From the Marquette University Law School, Milwaukee Public Television presents a debate between the candidates for the Wisconsin Supreme Court. The election will take place on April 5th. And hello again, everyone, and welcome to Marquette University Law School. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues, our continuing series of conversation with news and policymakers. Joining us tonight are the candidates for Wisconsin's highest court, the state Supreme Court. They are current Justice David Prosser and Assistant Attorney General Joanne Kloppenberg. They are both seeking a 10-year term on the court. Again, Election Day is less than two weeks away, April 5th. Tonight, the candidates for Wisconsin Supreme Court will be questioned by a former justice, Janine Geske, who currently serves as a distinguished professor in law here at Marquette University Law School. Also joining Janine tonight are two journalists who routinely cover the court, the Supreme Court. They are Patrick Marley from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and J.R. Ross from wispolitics.com, the political website. A couple of words tonight about our format. The candidates will have 90 seconds each to answer a question. There will be 30 seconds each for a rebuttal where that is appropriate. There will also be one minute opening and closing statements tonight. And having said that, we flipped a coin earlier and we have determined the order for tonight's event. And so we are going to begin with an opening statement from Wisconsin Supreme Court Justice David Prosser. Justice Prosser. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you to Marquette University Law School for hosting this debate. I've had the privilege for the last 12 and a half years of serving on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. I've loved the work, and I think I've proven that I can do the job. I've participated in more than 900 published decisions, written 132 majority opinions in almost every area of Wisconsin law. I've worked on uh, Supreme Court rules and often helped to fashion compromises on those rules. I reviewed uh, lots of attorney discipline cases. I've spoken to thousands and thousands of Wisconsin people about the court, and I've worked successfully with the legislature in behalf of the court. A Supreme Court election is really about choosing the best candidate based on experience and qualifications and someone who is going to demonstrate moderate, sound judgment over the next 10 years. I think I've proven that case and would appreciate your vote. Assistant Attorney General Kloppenberg. Thank you very much, Mike Boucher. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Marquette University. And I'm glad the Sweet 16 doesn't conflict with this event. I have been privileged to represent all of the people of Wisconsin as a prosecutor at the Department of Justice for over 20 years. I have firsthand experience in how important it is that judges be independent and impartial. I, unlike my opponent, will approach cases with an open mind and without having prejudged the matters that come before the court. I, unlike my opponent, will move the court forward, away from partisanship and personal quarrels. I, there, the court needs new blood. I will be independent, impartial, and fair. I will be the kind of justice that you would want to hear your cases. Thank you to both of the candidates, and now it is time to begin the questions. We'll start with Professor Geske, uh, who will ask the first question of Joanne Kloppenberg. Joanne Kloppenberg, I'm going to ask you, there has been a lot of reporting about discord or conflict on the Supreme Court <clears throat> over the last at least few years. I would like to know what you individually would do if you were elected to that position to help build collegiality. I would come on to the court, listen respectfully, not only to the parties who come before the court, but to the other justices. I would focus on the positive that they bring to the court and focus them all on, focus us all, on the, on the work that people elect us to do, which is decide cases, apply the law to the facts. As a director in my unit, I supervised attorneys. I did the same. I focused on the positive, on the work we were to do, and the result was a better product and a more collegial environment. David Prosser, I'm going to ask a similar question of you. You've been on the court, and you've identified at times that there is conflict on the court. What, what can you do to help the collegiality of the court and move forward in a positive way? I think, <clears throat> think my election to the court on April 5th will really dissipate a lot of the conflict on the court because it's about whether I should be reelected or not. Some people on the court don't want me reelected. Um, 
So I think it's going to be just like 1999. When, when I win, a lot of the, the conflict will go away. But I think some outside, uh, some entity should look at the operations of the court. And I think all of the members of the court need to try a little bit harder to get along and respect each other's views. Tolerance, tolerance, that's what we need more of. I'm going to give each of you 30 seconds to add any further thoughts on that subject, on, on this issue of collegiality. Joanne Kloppenberg, we'll begin with you. I think that it's difficult for a justice who has in public castigated the other justices, as, he, as my opponent did in State versus Green in 2007, um, and said that they were not a great court for what they did in that case. And Justice Crooks, in a published decision, criticized Justice Prosser for denigrating the other justices and calling what he had written hogwash. I believe that does not advance collegiality on the court. David Prosser, 30 seconds. Well, Justice Crooks did say hogwash, but he really didn't defend the substance of what was done there. I think it was one of the most embarrassing moments in the court for the court to deliberately violate the rules that we, that we have when we take the oath and not given timely justice uh, to a litigant before the court. I think it's one of the most embarrassing moments in the history of the court. The next question goes to Patrick Marley from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Patrick? As a follow-up to that, um, one of the ways to improve the collegiality on the court may be to look at uh, the cause of it. What do you see as the source of discord on the court? I'm, I'm not quite oh, hearing you, Patrick. What do you see as the source or sources of discord on the court? And if you were reelected, you've been on the court for 12 years, is there anything that you would do differently than you've done in the past to uh, change that? Well, I think I, I served in the legislature 18 years. Uh, during the time I served in the legislature, I was in the minority 16 of those years. I know how to lose. I know how to lose gracefully. And you can come out of a, a defeat um, still with a friendship for the other side. There's nothing wrong when, when people on the court uh, debate very vigorously uh, principles of law. And, and policy that goes into law. That's entirely healthy. It is, it is when people t turn to try to injure other people on the court that we have some real problems. Now, uh, I am not the source of conflict on the court. I may have say, said some incautious, incautious things. Undoubtedly, I've said some incautious things. But, I am not the source of the conflict on the court, and I will try very hard uh, to pull the court together. Uh, um, Joanne Kloppenberg, you're one person. There are seven people on the court. What can one person do on that uh, court? Why should the public believe that you could um, change things when there's six other people on that court already? I cannot. I'm not going to make, wave a magic wand, but there needs to be new blood. The dynamic on the court needs to change. And I think that coming on the court, respecting all of the justices who are on the court, and as I noted before, learning from them, focusing, focusing on the positive they had to contribute, and most importantly, not losing my temper. I have been a fighter for the people of Wisconsin and for the rule of law for over 20 years at the Department of Justice, and I've never been accused of losing my temper. Losing your temper does not solve problems. Instead of calling people names, you respect their positions, you focus on the job you're there to do, and you move the court forward as a collective entity to which you all belong. Justice Prosser, you have 30 seconds. Uh, I don't have any answer. Not, don't no. care to any, add anything further? All right. Next question goes to J.R. Ross. Uh, Joanne Kloppenberg. In announcing his hiring, uh, David Prosser's campaign director said, and I'm quoting here, our campaign efforts uh, will include building an organization that will return Justice Prosser to the bench, protecting the conservative judicial majority and acting as a common sense complement to both the new administration and legislature. Now, you've been critical of that comment, but you have to pass ties to Democrats. I mean, wouldn't it be assumed that you'll be a complement to the minority party if you're elected to the Supreme Court? No, not at all. In fact, I have depended for my success as a prosecutor on the independence and the impartiality of judges. Those words have real meaning to me. I am relying on the words and actions of the incumbent and his campaign 
And I have never, I have been consistent from the day I announced on December 7th, I will be independent and impartial. I do not see the court as operating in blocks. It does not help the people of Wisconsin if the court divides into partisan blocks. I am running to remove the partisan divide and to um, help restore people's confidence in the independence and impartiality of the court. I have been independent as a prosecutor at the Department of Justice, served under four attorneys general, two Democrat and two Republican. I have set aside my personal and political beliefs for 22 years to serve the interests of the people of Wisconsin and do what the law requires. It is not a far step to do the same as a justice on the court. And, and David Prosser, was that an appropriate compliment? May, may I respond to that? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, let's, let's set the record straight. A news release was issued in my campaign in early December. I never saw it. I didn't authorize it. I have disavowed it. Now, everybody knows that. It's been on television and it's been in print. What is very disturbing is that uh, uh, Joanne Kloppenberg's campaign repeatedly attributes that news release to me. And in fact, uh, it's more than that. Her whole Facebook page is really an appeal to votes to decide a particular case that might come before the court. I, I think that is a complete violation of impartiality. Joanne Klopperberg, you have 30 seconds. Words have a lot of power. I have been consistent in my words. Justices have to get it right the first time. I did not hear any disavowal, uh, is disavowal of those words until very recently, just before the election takes place. His campaign has also said this race is just about a 4-3 conservative majority versus a 3-4 liberal majority and no more. And it is about so much more. It is about returning independence and impartiality to the court. David Prosser? What she said is simply not true. Because my campaign manager specifically talked either, either to Joanne or her campaign manager and took responsibility for the ad. Now, it is not honest with the people when a falsehood keeps being repeated by a candidate for the Supreme Court. I, I think it's terribly embarrassing. Mike, can I ask a follow-up real quick? Sure. Uh, David Prosser, you said she's appealing on our Facebook page to a certain case. Can you talk what case you're talking about and why you think that's inappropriate? I, I'm, you said her Facebook page appeals on a certain case. Can you talk about which case you're referring to and why you think yeah. that's inappropriate? If, if you look at uh, 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 Attorney Kloppenberg's Facebook page, it is filled with entries of people who, who want a change in the Supreme Court solely for the purpose of deciding cases that come out of the governor's budget repair bill or the governor's budget bill. Uh, to po post those up there, not to take them down, to, to have attacks on the governor, have attacks on, on legislators and calling for recalls and linking me into all of that really is, is totally inappropriate and it creates problems of whether she could sit in any of those cases coming up in the future if she were elected. Joanne Kloppenberg will give you 30 seconds okay. here. What people say on my Facebook is what they say and there's nothing untrue about what they are posting on my Facebook. They understand that it is so important to have an independent and impartial court that the partisanship in politics are where they belong, in the legislative and executive branches, not on the court, and they are disturbed and alarmed by my opponent's expressions of his partisan background and his partisan conduct on the court and his campaign's expressions of his partisan approach to cases that will reach the court. People who uh, attended the, the protests in Madison uh, oftentimes saw signs that said, vote Kloppenberg. Uh, at those events, there are now ads on the air by a liberal-leaning advocacy group uh, uh, essentially touting your campaign and saying that David Prosser would not be a good choice. Do you think that, that this does present, as David Prosser just suggested, a, a, a potential problem for you? Would you feel that given some of the endorsements and support you have received that you might have to recuse yourself from some cases, for example, a collective bargaining case or an open meetings law case that came before you? Not at all. I've been very careful not to participate in any of those rallies or take any positions and to hew to that middle road of being independent and impartial. 
And in fact, what people, I've put on 9,000 miles on my mother-in-law's Buick around the state the last few weeks, few months, and people tell me to a person, they come up to me afterwards and they say, we're supporting you because you are independent and impartial. We don't want to know how you've prejudged these matters. We don't want to know where you stand. We want you because you are being independent and impartial. So you could see no instances where you might have to recuse yourself None given some of what's likely to come before the court? None at all. None at all. Uh, David Prosser, let me have you address the fact that, that someone from your campaign did utter those words. Um, does that put you in a difficult position? Uh, also, the fact that you worked together for a number of years closely in the state, uh, uh, in state government with Scott Walker when he was uh, an assemblyman. Um, are, are you possibly in, in the same position where you might have to recuse yourself from cases uh, given uh, the fact that these are cases that are part of the governor's agenda? No, <clears throat> because I haven't taken a position on, on that. On virtually every place that I have gone, Mike, I talk about my record as an independent justice over 12 and a half years and my, my absolute commitment to impartiality on any legislation that comes forward in the past. Now, I want you to listen very carefully to what my opponent has said. She has said that there's nothing misleading or wrong and anything in her Facebook page that other people have put up. If she doesn't take those things down, she's responsible for those things. Now, one of them that kind of struck me was, stop the turd, vote Kloppenberg. Well, now, am I the turd, or is, is the governor the turd? E either, either I am being sort of uh, dissed, or she's committing herself to vote in a particular way in a particular case. And, uh, that, that's totally inappropriate. Join Kloppenberg, you have 30 seconds to respond. Justice Prosser's campaign has continued since December 8th to appeal to a very narrow segment of voters who want to know how he will decide cases and will vote for him because they know how he will decide cases. I have appealed from the time I announced on December 7th to all voters of the state be, and to say, you will not know how, how I will vote or decide cases. You should vote for me because I will be truly independent and impartial. 30 seconds. Well, I, I, I think if you run a Facebook page, you allow people to use that page to call for recalls, to attack the governor, uh, to attack me because I won't be impartial on a bill that, that hasn't come before the court. She's really trying to set up a referendum on cases that might come before the court. And that's not the way we should decide Supreme Court elections. That's destroying an independent judiciary in our state. I, I don't think you can look at, at my record and say that I am not the most unpredictable, impartial person on the court. The next question goes to uh, Professor Geske. And I'm going to start with Joanne Kloppenberg. Um, both of you have talked about being independent and impartial, and I'm going to push that a little further. Ms. Kloppenberg, can you think of a controversial case uh, with a 4-3 decision where you would have joined Justice Prosser in his vote? Before I answer that question, I just would like to add one quick thing, and that is I am not responsible for what, I don't control what people post on my Facebook. But we're all familiar with the, especially people in this audience, with the principles of agency. And a, can, a candidate must take responsibility for what his or her campaign manager says. In answer your, to, to your question, I, it would be presumptuous of me to determine how I would decide a case without having read the briefs, without having heard the oral arguments of the parties, without having done the research and engaged in a discussion with the other justices. I am not second guessing the decisions that have already been made. Including Justice Prosser's decisions? Including his decisions on substance issues of law. I do find fault with his uh, decision on finding that the Gableman ad, which people tell me around the state they perceive to have been a lie, that it wasn't a lie. And I do find fault with his leading the court 
in adopting verbatim recusal rules that were written by entities that appear before the court, WMC and the Realtors Association. Can you think of anything you would join him on? Any rules? I know it's just test on off the, the top cases of your head, that I've won where he's been on the same side as me? Yes. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, David Prosser, um, you call yourself often a judicial conservative, but um, you also talk about your independence and your impartiality. Can you cite a case where you cast a vote that would have upset the conservative community? Well, there was a case last term that I wrote. <clears throat> it came out of Walworth County and involved a, a um, I think, an arrest and information that uh, uh, the defendant wanted to suppress. The police made an arrest and got information from that arrest uh, when they were acting in complete good faith on the basis of a, an arrest warrant was issued. The response, or excuse me, the responsibility for having that arrest warrant uh, defective was, lay entirely with the court. So we had a guy, uh, the, the evidence was good, uh, the people would have liked to be able to use that evidence. But in, in my view, the, the warrant was so completely defective that it would not have been responsible to allow the evidence to be used. So, so that's one I'm very proud of. There was another case that involved a search of a cell phone where I was in a dissent. The majority said, oh, this is fine that the officers went through the cell phone and got information. Um, I, I found it terribly offensive and wrong that they used that information. Thank you. Anybody? OK. We'll go to Patrick Marley. Uh, you both decided to uh, participate in the new public financing law. You both decided to participate in this new public financing law. You get uh, $300,000 each in this. You got $100,000 uh, in the primary campaign. Uh, this law was passed by the legislature with the idea of uh, limiting the influence of outside interests. Do you feel that this law has worked? Has it shielded? the race from um, outside interests and outside politics? Or has it failed to do that? And if it's failed to do that, uh, what should be done? Should the law be changed or should it be scrapped? The law is terrific in the sense that it doesn't require candidates to, to go to people and say, will you please be on my finance committee and uh, really be actively involved in fundraising. In that sense, it's terrific. But the, the uh, amount of money that has been made available, just taking it out of the Treasury, is inadequate <coughs> for candidates to run a serious statewide campaign, really tell their story, and reach all parts of the state. So uh, the, the changes that I would make right off the bat would be to get rid of some of the nitpicky details I don't think I would provide funding until people come through a primary election. And then frankly, if we're serious about public funding, there has to be more money. Uh, we certainly have not done a thing to discourage third parties from getting involved in the race, uh, in, in negative campaigns or otherwise. In fact, any objective observer, I think, is going to look at the law and say, this race is going to be controlled by third party can by, by third party interests pumping money into the race. And that's exactly the way it is working. And money is being poured in to discredit me. Same question to you, Joanne Kloppenberg. I, I disagree with Justice Prosser. The public financing law, first of all, first expanded the pool of candidates, which is always good in a democracy. And by liberating us from having to raise money, it has required that I at least go around the state and make connections with literally thousands of people who may not have before thought much about the Supreme Court or participated in April elections. And, I, and we engage in conversations about my background and my <coughs> qualifications and my approach to the job and how important it is to have an independent Supreme Court. I have made connections with people and built a broad and deep base of grassroots support thanks to the public financing law, which has freed me to travel the state and make these connections with people. And they now have an ownership and a stake in this race, and they've invested in this race, and they are better informed than ever before. 
And I've told them the third party ads will come. They have a First Amendment right to do so. No state has figured out yet how to regulate them consistent with the Constitution. And they'll come on all sides. They came for Justice Prosser in the primary. They're now coming for both of us. And I tell people, be ready. Those ads will come. But you have, you have already become informed. You've made a commitment. Talk to your friends. Talk to your colleagues. Talk to your family. And don't let these ads take the race away from you as the voters. And I think we'll see that that's exactly what happens. I, I do think, I've run out of time, that the next step is a good first step. The next step is to figure out I think all states are struggling. What do you do with third party ads that the Supreme Court has held? Folks have a uh, constitutional right to run. David Prosser, you have 30 seconds. It, it <clears throat> seems to me that uh, Attorney Kloppenberg is working hand in glove with third party interests who are pumping all sorts of money into this race. I think you heard her say, I'm not responsible as the candidate for comments that appear on my Facebook. Well, of course you're responsible. You can take them down. Uh, if, if you don't disavow people who, who want to make this a referendum on a future case and not about the merits of the candidates, you've got to do something about that. Joanne Kloppenberg, 30 seconds. Well, I think I will just say that that accusation could be made back and forth, that we are each working hand in glove with the third parties that are putting ads out there in support and against each of us. I haven't made that accusation to Justice Prosser, and it's below the belt for him to do the, that to me. My time is up. J.R. Ross from WIS Politics has the next question. Uh, Joanne Kloppenberg, your first TV of the primary uh, feature supporter touting you as a tough prosecutor, which in the public's mind creates an image of somebody who's tough on crime and criminals. Are, what does being a prosecutor have to do with being on the Supreme Court, number one? And number two, will you tout those kind of credentials in a TV ad? Are you sending a message to people that, that criminals won't get a fair shake before you uh, when you're on the Supreme Court, if you're on the Supreme Court? No, I never said I was tough on crime. I said I was, I am tough and fair as a prosecutor, and I have earned a reputation for being tough, fair, and independent. I, my job has been to enforce the law on behalf of the people of Wisconsin, and I have done that in a, in a tough but fair way. My supporters include attorneys who work on the same side as me, as well as many attorneys who are members of the defense bar. They know that from the way I have approached my enforcement cases that I will be independent and impartial. I do believe it misleads people to say that the Supreme Court is all about fighting crime, when in fact 75% of the cases are civil, 25% are criminal, and it's the circuit court judges who sentence defendants. And the Supreme Court then corrects errors that may have been made and sends it back down for those errors to be corrected. And no one I know around the state has said that there's a problem with circuit court judges being soft on crime. So being tough on crime was not my message. Being tough in representing the interests of the people of Wisconsin against people who have violated the laws of Wisconsin. That was my message. And David Prosser, you've also talked about your years as a district attorney in your campaign. Why does that matter for being a Supreme Court justice? Well, I think, I think people are concerned about public safety in our state. Really, Joanne is incredibly envious of my record. I worked at the highest levels of government in the Office of Criminal Justice making federal criminal justice policy, and then I've been a district attorney and prosecuted street crime. I prosecuted violent crime. I've had victims of crime cry on my shoulder. She has a very different record uh, as a prosecutor. It's all the prosecution of DNR regulations, uh, docs, uh, the length of docs the width of docs, whether people can have docs. That's a completely different kind of prosecution than I am familiar with and have been writing cases about as well for 12 and a half years. Join Kloppenberg. I've prosecuted companies that had economic benefits by not investing in the pollution controls that companies that comply with the law invest in. I have prosecuted companies that have spewed poisons into the air and poisons into the water. I have improved the quality of life for communities around the state. 
And unlike the incumbent, I have had such a broad experience in so many different communities around the world and around the state. I am much more active in my community. I was a Peace Corps volunteer. I started the WIT program for, in two different counties in upstate New York. And I have continued to serve my community even as I have worked at the Department of Justice. Final 30 seconds. Well, now, <clears throat> you've just heard an attack. I'm not as involved as the, in the community as Joanne Kloppenberg. O over the last 12 years, I participated in Wisconsin Women Government seminars. I've, I've uh, uh, youth in government for, for probably 25 years. I speak to students all the time. I go to classes. I go to bar associations. I, I love to meet with international students and foreign students. So I'm reaching out to young people, and I'm very, very much involved in the community. That, that, that's below the belt here, Joanne. Next question goes to David Prosser, and I want to talk about judicial activism for a moment. Justice Prosser, uh, your latest TV ad uh, touts you for taking the lead in the court overturning a transfer from the patient's compensation fund that was used to help balance the budget. In doing so, the court also overturned the intent of the legislature and the governor, which critics often decry as judicial activism. So the question is, does that mean judicial activism can be a good thing? Well, I, <clears throat> I don't think that was judicial activism at all. Uh, a trust fund was set up, I think it was 25, 35, 30 years ago. And that trust fund was for a specific purpose, to protect injured patients and their family as a result of medical malpractice. Doctors put money into that fund, and right from the beginning, it's called a trust, and then to firm up the nature of that trust, the legislature said that the money cannot, in this trust, cannot be used for any other purpose. Now, the legislature came along, they needed some money, they said let's take 200 million bucks this time and put it into something else, uh, quite contrary to the intent of the fund. And then in the, they argued both in front of the, the circuit court and then in front of our court, the legislature can take all of this money. That's not right. That is a total violation of the law, and it was unconstitutional. Joanne Kloppenberg, can you cite any examples where you believe the court was correct in overturning the legislature and governor, and why were the justices right in doing that? Before I get to that question, I would just like to follow up. It is inappropriate for Justice Prosser to use that patient, patient compensation fund decision as an advertisement seeking political support. He uses it on his website and he uses it, uses it in his advertisement. And so people cannot have confidence as to whether he will be deciding a case based on the facts and the law or for, for a to gain a political advantage. I will certainly never use my authorship of a decision to gain political support. I cannot think right now of a case where the, you asked where the court has overturned the legislature? Mm -hmm. Or governor. Or governor? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not, it's not uncommon for the court to do so <coughs> where the legislature or the governor has acted in in violation of the Constitution, so it's, it's not something that I would pay special attention well, to. Well, let me go back to your point that you just made uh, right. about, you said it was inappropriate for him to, to use that. <laughs> why, why is it inappropriate to talk about your record as a justice? It's fine to talk about your record, but he is using his authorship of that decision to gain political support and using this particular case to solicit um, s political support, for, and, and so you can't be sure that, you know, he's touting um, the, po uh, the political advantage that he might get from having authored that decision, and that's not appropriate. David Prosser. I think it's perfectly appropriate for a, a candidate for the Supreme Court, an incumbent candidate, to talk about my record. And my record includes that decision and 131 other majority opinions. 
I, I'm also willing to talk about uh, dissenting or concurring opinions. But I think it's perfectly legitimate, and people have to understand that the argument was that the legislature could take every single dime of that fund and charge the doctors all over again. That's not fair, and it wasn't right. And you don't view that as judicial activism? I don't view that as judicial activism. That's applying the Constitution and the statutes. Joanne Kloppenberg, you get 30 seconds here if you'd like it. Although I can't identify a case where the court has overturned the governor or the legislature, I can identify certain cases in which Justice Prosser and his dissent would fill gaps left by the legislature without waiting for the legislature to do so. He wanted to create a privilege in the Sands case. He wanted to create a statute of limitations in the Haferman case. He wanted to use the inherent authority of the court to fix something that he <coughs> felt was, um, was unfair by following the statutes in the Jackson County case. And that's not appropriate for the court to do. Thank you. Next question to Professor Geske. Joanne Klebenberg, um, th th we've already had some discussion about elections and the problems with special interest money. And, and of course, this is not just a Wisconsin problem. It is a national problem in all states where judges are elected. Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot written. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor travels around the country and talks about the appoint importance of having an appointed judiciary, not an elected judiciary, because of the millions and millions of dollars being put into elections. Should judges be elected or appointed, and why? Both ways of getting judges have their problems. We've seen in Iowa, which has an appointed system, that after a unanimous decision in a controversial, controversial case, when three of the justices were up for the up or down vote, um, but as to whether still they was should, an election, although it's not with other with opponents, right? right? They were um, they had been appointed, and outside special interests flooded Iowa with money, and those three justices ended up recall, being recalled. A justice should be able to decide to decide cases without fear of being recalled under the influence of special outside special interests. So there are politics that can intrude in the appointment system. So if someone develops it, they have to think about how to deal with that. We have elections right now. The Impartial Justice Act is one step toward improving judicial elections. So far, it has worked. Both Justice Prosser and I have been able to focus on our qualifications, our backgrounds, and our approach to being justice. And I think we've laid the groundwork so that people around the st state are ready for whatever outside ads, issue ads might come. But certainly the next step is for Congress, I suppose, to, to lead the way and see if, if, if it can figure out how to um, reduce the influence of excessive issue ad spending by third parties that still remains in our electoral system. David Prosser, the same question. Uh, boy, I have to respond to what she said. Congress has no business tampering with judicial elections in Wisconsin. Uh, and I'm all for judicial elections. I'm for judicial elections because the Supreme Court and, and judges generally have enormous power. And sooner or later, people who exercise that enormous power need to be held accountable. It's worked well over the years. I think the people, a lot of the people, who, who want to go to an appointed judiciary don't want any accountability uh, for those people who engage in judicial activism. I'm, I'm perfectly willing to have people judge me on my record, particularly my decisions and how I reason them and, and the, the basic soundness of those decisions. There are some people who don't want to be held accountable for their decisions. And that's what judicial elections are for. I think we agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, let's go to Patrick Marley from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. David Prosser, uh, the court ruled a few years ago that a case could proceed against the lead paint industry, even that, though the, yeah, the lead the, paint the lead paint case, even though the plaintiff could not prove uh, which company manufactured the paint that uh, sickened him. Uh, you were in dissent in that case. Can you uh, explain your reasoning a little bit? The, the reason was we're, we're talking about a case uh, in which a, a badly injured plaintiff, a sympathetic plaintiff, had already recovered some funds, but he wanted to recover more money. 
And so he went after people who uh, produced white lead carbonate over a hundred year period. There, there was no need to identify who produced it in a particular case. Uh, this young man lived, I, I believe, in three, three different houses. So when we're talking about negligence, we're, we're talking about the critical factor of causation. There was no ability to link the injury to the party that caused the injury. And, and that, that was so shocking. It just completely uh, blew the doors off traditional negligence law. And that's why I voted in dissent. Joanne Klappenberg, how would you have ruled in that case? Again, and maybe it's because I take these cases as a litigator who must follow them without having, it would be presumptuous, without having heard the arguments, read the briefs, done the research, engaged in a discussion with the other justices, to second guess how I would rule. That was a controversial decision. There were good arguments for both sides. And what, and it's not unusual with a controversial decision like that for the legislature to have taken action and um, determine the law the way it's, it thinks the law should be. In, in answering the issue that was decided in that case. Well, you have talked about uh, how you would rule in, uh, for instance, the uh, ethics case against uh, Justice Gableman. Why, in that instance, would you be willing to say how you'd rule, but not in the lead paint case? Because the Gableman case is the three who were on the other side of Justice Prosser decided just to allow the claim against Gableman to go forward to trial. And I believe that was the right decision. Similarly with the recusal rules, it was not an all or nothing situation where you had to adopt the rule written by one set of entities or another, the League of Women Voters. Rather, an, an agency like the court should have taken all that input that it received, the concerns that were expressed, about the deficiency in the current subjective recusal rule, and then decided for themselves whether to write a new rule or revi revise the rules that were there, rather than accepting verbatim any of the rules that were submitted to the court. And so those are decisions that, um, that everyone around the state gets and can understand how they were in error. Patrick, <clears throat> there was no need to go forward to trial. The facts had been stipulated in the case. When the facts are stipulated, you don't have to go and, and, and find new facts in the case. Now, what, what people often forget is that a three-judge panel of, of judges picked by the chief judge of the Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court had nothing to do with it. That panel unanimously recommended that the Supreme Court dismiss the case. When uh, Joanne talks about uh, going back to trial, I mean, that, that is a fundamental misunderstanding of what went on in this case. And it's plain nonsense what she just said. 30 seconds. The decision to <coughs> say that the Gableman ad, which people around the state perceived to have been a lie, was not a lie, was enormously damaging to the reputation of the court. And we need to move forward, and I've said this before, we need to move forward. I'm sure that neither Justice Prosser nor I will ever run an ad like that, nor will any other candidate in the future. And we, we need to recognize the damage it did and move forward in a constructive way and restore people's confidence in the impartiality of the court. J.R. Russ from Bush Politics. Uh, Joanne Kloppenberg, can you name the U.S. Supreme Court justice that you most admire and cite a ruling that he or she wrote that's influenced your legal thinking? I have followed Justice Stevens as his um, ideas about the death penalty have evolved over the years, and I have found it very informative and interesting to read how, how he has developed his view of the constitutionality of the death penalty. 
And I think what, that sh what, that, what I take from that is that um, you, can't, you can't ever set your ideas in concrete. You have to be open not only to what the parties are arguing before you, but what the other justices are saying. And you have to always be keeping an, an open mind and not um, rely on your preconceptions as you are deciding cases. And David Pross, the same question for you. My two favorite justices are William Rehnquist and Hugo Black. Uh, somewhat similar reasons, but uh, substantially different reasons. I worked in the United States Department of Justice when uh, Bill Rehnquist was there. Uh, he called me up one day, even though I'd never met him, and complimented me on a piece of testimony I'd written for the Deputy Attorney General. So when a guy goes on the Supreme Court after he's complimented me, you know, you kind, of, you kind of like that. I think he was a wonderful justice in the clarity and orderliness of many, many of his opinions. And I also met Hugo Black at one point in a, in a seminar. I loved the simplicity of his language and the way he could uh, reduce a principle of law to an aphorism. So it's, it's really the style of writing uh, that I, I really liked in both of them, but the substance of a lot of what Justice Rehnquist did. I want to uh, ask uh, perhaps a final question here, and then we'll go to closing statements. But, but I was struck by something that Joanne Kloppenberg just said. Uh, she talked about the long-term damage done by the Gableman ad. Uh, in your opinion, David Prosser, did the Gableman ad do long-term damage to the court, to the way the court is perceived, to the way judicial elections are run in this state? Well, the, the Gableman ad was distasteful. I, I don't think there's any question about it. In, in my view, the, the Gableman ad probably violated the second sentence of a Supreme Court rule, but it did not violate the first sentence. The second sentence was an aspirational sentence. I, I think the public in the state should l really look to those Supreme Court candidates who try to run honest, forthright, uplifting campaigns talk about their credentials, treat their, their opponents with some dignity, uh, and have that backed up with facts. When people don't level uh, with, with the public about their background or their views, they're, they're not running the right kind of campaign. So I'm not gonna run anything like what happened in the Gableman campaign, but we're gonna get over it. And the people who lost the election need to get over it too. Joanne Kloppenberg, I'll come back to you to elaborate on your observation from earlier. As I said, I've talked to thousands of people, covered 9,000 miles, and people bring that up to me repeatedly as something, not only the ad, but the way the court addressed it, that the three to three tie fell along partisan lines. And so it's the partisanship that followed the ad that troubles them, and, and they continue to be, to disturbed when a candidate or his campaign s suggests that partisanship is appropriate on the court. And what it really did for, for people around the state is realize how important it is to have a court that is truly independent and impartial and not partisan. David Prosser? I, I don't think I have any response. All right. What we'll do then is uh, we will go to closing statements from each of you, um, uh, and uh, it will be a one-minute closing statement, and then we will uh, uh, wrap things up. But uh, we determined by the uh, coin flip earlier that uh, Joanne Kloppenberg would have the uh, final word tonight. So, David Prosser, you have the first closing statement. We've heard a lot tonight about impartiality, and that's, that's vitally important. But I don't think uh, Joanne understands what impartiality means. She's been an advocate for all her entire professional career. You can't be an advocate and be impartial. I ask people to look at my record over the last 12 and a half years, right in the center of the court. I can go to the left, I can go to the right. I am not a predictable person. I try to judge each case on the facts and the law and truly be an honest broker for people. That's the kind of justice you want, not with a lot of 
repetition of a phrase or a word, but actual performance in office. So, my friends, uh, it's been great to be here tonight. I'd really appreciate your support on April 5th. Joanne Kloppenberg, you have the final word tonight. As an advocate, I have seen how important it is that judges be independent and impartial. I have, for my entire professional life, not seen the world through a partisan lens, but through the lens of someone who is there to serve the interests of the people of Wisconsin and uphold the law. I am running to restore people's confidence that the court will truly be independent and impartial. I will not prejudge matters that come before the court. I will approach every case with an open mind without thinking of what outcome will favor one political party or the other. I will be the kind of justice that you would want to hear your, your cases, and I hope that I will earn all of your votes on April 5th. Thank you very much. Joanne Kloppenberg, David Prosser, we appreciate your time tonight. Thanks to both of you for being with us at Marquette University Law School. Uh, our crowd has been uh, so wonderful tonight. They've been just very quiet. So now we'll, we'll give them the opportunity, if they'd like to applaud, they can do that right now. Before we go tonight, I would like to say a couple of special thank yous. First of all, uh, a thank you to our media participants tonight, um, Milwaukee Public Television, who will broadcast this event for us, uh, WISPolitics.com and the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. I'd like to thank all of the panelists, Janine Geske, Patrick Marley, and J.R. Ross. And I'd like to say a special thanks to the folks at home watching and the folks here at Eckstein Hall at Marquette University Law School for being with us tonight. I'm Mike Goucher on behalf of the law school. Thanks very much for being with us, and we hope you have a wonderful evening. Good night. Thank <laughs> you.